Out to center. This is Kranz. It's way back. It is gone. Welcome back to the Couch GM Podcast. Today I have on Joe Doyle, who is a senior analyst for the Future Stars series. He also has a great podcast on Patreon called Overslot, in which he talks through the MLB prospects, the MLB draft, college athletes, and everything having to do with minor league prospects. Today we talk through the upcoming MLB draft, which will be taking place next month. We get into who the Mariners might be selecting with their 15th overall pick as well as their picks after that. We also get into a bit of why the Mariners offense might have been struggling, why Julio Rodriguez has been struggling, and much more. Make sure to go check him out on Twitter, at Joe Doyle, M-I-L-B, and I hope you enjoy the episode. This podcast is sponsored by Black Label Supplements, a third-party tested, athlete-approved supplement company that's local here in the Pacific Northwest. They're putting out some great products. My personal favorite is the Pure Power Sour Watermelon. That's the creatine. Make sure to check it out. Blacklabelsupplements.com. Use code COUCHGM for 15% off your order. And to help support the Couch GM brand, make sure to give this episode a share. And if you or someone you know is thinking of buying, selling, or refinancing, send them my way to Connor Webb, also known as the Couch GM, to hit a home run with your mortgage financing needs. I am a mortgage advisor during the day, and it's my role to help advise my clients onto which mortgage financing option is going to be best for their situation. And with that, let's get into the podcast. All right, Joe Doyle, Prospect Insider. Really appreciate you taking the time, especially during this this period in uh, you know the draft coming up, the combine last week. How have things been for you, and what are things looking like for your, you personally right now? Very busy time of year. Uh, just got back from the combine, uh, about to be the summer showcase circuit, popping around, seeing different high schoolers for 2025. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'm just kind of I'm just kind of wrapping up my 2024 draft process and. Uh, switching over to minor league prospects and kind of getting a good, a good look there. But yeah, busy time of year. Uh, it's always fun. It's always fun this time of year. I love it. Yeah. So you mentioned uh, the the uh, the combine was last week, and that you've been talking nonstop to people about the draft, the prospects. How much has changed over these past few weeks as far as rankings that that you've heard of, and then you know with the the College World Series wrapping up and everything like that. Well, I think the biggest thing. Well, speaking on on the College World Series, Christian Moore at Tennessee is a guy that has continued to really surge and push his name higher and higher up boards. I think Ryan Waldschmidt, the outfielder at Kentucky, has has kind of done the same. Honestly, though, in terms of like rankings, the the public industry, myself, Baseball America, Pipeline, all those guys, like we've been pushing out rankings for several months, right? Teams have been doing the same thing. But as of two weeks ago that's really when front offices general managers scouting directors they all get together for their pre-draft meetings where they kind of start to put together a game plan they kind of start to figure out what they want to do guys that stand out uh, on their models and then next week uh the about july 3rd july 4th july 5th that's when they'll have the, their final draft meetings that's when you know the stickers and the magnets will go on the board and we'll actually get a, a little bit more feel about what where teams will go um, so from an industry perspective there has been some shifting on guys that seem to be trending up boards behind the scenes but in terms of like rankings changing too much i generally don't see too much changing uh, in the public sector my sector i guess if you want to call it uh, towards the end of the year it, it, draft stock and stuff has already kind of set itself by the middle of may and especially the the top you know 5 10 15 i'm sure a lot of those guys are the same names that we've been seeing for a while um yeah let, let's let's get into the top 5 to 10 guys i mean there's been a lot of hype around bazana caglione a lot of these guys who do you think is going to that top 5 who who do you think's getting t- getting taken yeah, so that's a good question, man. Um, the interesting thing about the draft, and it's why I, I fell in love with the draft, is you know the signing bonuses, right? The haircuts, the the ability to save money and spend money elsewhere in the draft. I think it's what makes the the Major League Baseball draft unique and so much different than every other draft. And, and also, it's the only draft where you take a player and they're not going to be providing value to your organization for at least a year and a half, two years. So that is a huge wrinkle that that always comes into play. But in terms of the top five, like if I was guessing just purely based on talent alone, I feel pretty good about Chase Burns uh, going in the top five. I feel pretty good about Travis Bazana, the second baseman from, from Oregon State, going in the top five. 
I would be surprised at this point if J.J. Weatherholt from West Virginia doesn't find a way into the top five. Um, Charlie Condon probably has a floor of two or three. So I think I give you four names there, maybe five. And, and I would probably throw Jack Caglione as, as the guy that is, is unique and, and powerful and uh, interesting. He probably fits somewhere in that three or five range for some teams. So those are the names that I continue to hear more and more at the top. Yeah, and Caglione, I've heard that teams will likely just move him to a hitter only. Is that what you're kind of hearing? Or is there a possibility that he might be pitching also? Yeah, man, like, listen, here's the thing. Two-way, he's such a special hitter is the thing. I, we're not talking about a guy that could be a good bat and could be a good arm. Like, it's a special, special bat and a good mm -hmm. arm. And so I look at it like this. He's got so much positive momentum right now with the bat. He's doing some incredible things for a guy his size, things that guys that size just don't do. Um, the risk of taking the bat out of his hands due to an elbow injury. You look at Jason Dominguez, right. you look at Bryce Harper, you look at some of the Juan Soto. Um, I, I know Juan Soto didn't have the Tommy John, but the risk of taking the bat out of his hands and losing all that positive momentum for six to eight months and then ending his pitching career, I just think is too great. I think you stick him at first base, you let him develop as a glove. And you just let that bat continue to reach new heights. That At least that's what I would do. The people that do believe he's an arm tend to think he's a bullpen arm. Let's have that be the fallback if if the bat totally craters for some reason. Yeah, absolutely. Really ch chase his upside, which is the bat. Um, yeah. And if, if you're listening to this, make sure to check out Joe Doyle on Overslot on Patreon. He's got a great podcast talking about all things inside prospects and baseball. Let's get into the Mariners a little bit. Um, it's going to be an interesting draft, probably different from what we've seen in years past. I would imagine, you know, in the past, they've been able to draft and develop the top pitching, which have all graduated to the major leagues right now they, you know, last year they took the, the young bats in the high school ranks. Where do you think the Mariners are going to go this year? Uh, we've heard college pitcher potentially to kind of restock the upper levels in their pitching department. What, what do you think the Mariners are going to go for at pick 15? And then after that. Yeah, you know, you never you never draft for need. I think it's the most dangerous thing. It, it allows you the it, the chance of walking away from stardom, you know, just for taking for taking mm -hmm. need. But I think in, in this draft particularly, I don't know how much exceptional value is going to be available to Seattle after pick 15 if they take a college pitcher, for example. So I think personally, and talking to some different people, if if, if Trey Savage from East Carolina is there. I have a hard time seeing them walk away from his, you know, rocket ship to the big leagues. I think Trey Savage could be in, in the big leagues at the end of 2025. I really do. I mean, he's got three exceptional pitches. He throws a ton of strikes. He's he's got a he's got a baseball card with a track record on it. Hard for me to see him not being very, very inviting to Seattle. If he's off the board, and listen, there's a chance that he goes to Boston at 12. There's a chance that he goes to San Francisco at 13. If he's off the board, I think Seattle is going to be advantageous and opportunistic as it pertains to college bats. I think they would hope that someone like James Tibbs or Nick Kurtz or, um, you know, maybe maybe Ryan Waldschmidt, one of these guys is, is an option there. I tend to get the sense that high school bats are mostly off the board, although Theo Gillen, uh, that high school shortstop out of Texas, I think for the right dollar figure, he could be in play. This I'll say this, this draft, one more thing, Connor. Yeah. I'll say yeah. one other thing. I've been doing this for 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 quite a few years now. Um, I can't recall a draft where there's been more question marks, like top to bottom. There there just seems to be really? question marks from one all the way to thirty. I mean, there are just not a lot of teams that know what they're going to do yet, and Seattle, I think, squarely falls into that category. Interesting. Um, is this is this draft a little less high school heavy? I mean, last year I know that it was super high school heavy in the first round, um, and part of that had to do with COVID and you know some of the effects of that. Is this is this year a little less high school, more college in the top and in, in the top round? Yeah, it's it's certainly not special high school. There's not a lot of special high schoolers. I mean, Connor Griffin and Bryce Rayner are are pretty spectacular athletes. They've got size, they've got physicality, they play up the middle of the field. They haven't performed like the high school bats from last year. I mean, 
Bryce Rayner could be a top five pick, a top six pick. And Colt Emerson would destroy his high school production from a year ago. A lot of those guys, Aiden Miller, the exact same way. Just they performed at every stop. Bryce Rayner has had a really nice spring, but he's never performed with the bat. So those two do stand out from a prototypical conventional scouting perspective. After that, it's a lot of guys that are interesting with some traits, but they don't have, you know, the the track record that some of those guys I just listed do. They don't have the Johnny Farmello tools. Um, there are some high school shortstops, like I mentioned, Gillen, Wyatt Sanford, Tyson Lewis, that I think are going to do well, and a couple of high school pitchers in Cam Caminiti and Cash Mayfield. But as a whole, there's not a whole lot of, I'll call it, star upside on the high school end. Uh, there are development projects that do excite teams, but I think most teams would admit, like if you look at Colt Emerson, had he stayed healthy, there's a chance that he gets to to Seattle as a 20-year-old or a 21-year-old. I don't see many of these high schoolers getting to the big leagues before they're 22. Could be wrong, but I don't see it. Yeah, for sure. And then moving into, uh, you know, you look at Tyler Lockley or Ryan Bliss, some of these guys that have come up from the Mariners and as we're talking about, you know, pitching for the Mariners, uh, Logan Evans was drafted in the 12th round, and he's potentially going to be coming up and making an impact on the big league roster. What have you seen from Tyler Locklear, from Ryan Bliss, from their upsides, insights on Logan Evans? I've heard great things about him throughout the system. Uh, what have you seen from those guys? Yeah, listen, I um, I do a podcast every week with with Jason Churchill, and we talk about Mariners and prospects in the league in general. I think Ryan Bliss is probably the most exciting player of that bunch, to be honest with you, from my perspective. I mean, he has a chance to play up the middle of the field. I think he needs work at second base. He's made some spectacular plays at second base, but he's also made some uh, some turns at the pillow for, for double plays that need work, he needs faster hands. And I think that'll come. But, you know, he's a guy that can steal bases. He's a guy that can put the ball in play. There's a little bit of juice in that bat. He can cheat a little bit on fastballs. Um, I think Ryan Bliss has a chance. It may not be in Seattle, but I think he has a chance to develop into a full-time regular second baseman at the big league level. Um, Locklear is one that I'm still struggling with. I mean, there's quite a bit of swing and miss in his game. Um, I, I still haven't seen him barrel up a fastball. Uh, you know, he's hit the changeups. He's hit the sliders. He showed a bit of a polished approach, which I think is, is um, exciting to see from a, a player of his age. But... If you're going to survive in this game, you know, Tyler Locklear hasn't faced off against elite arms, at least not at a high clip yet. I'll be interested to see whether or not he can handle 97 on the hands. Can he turn on that? Because say what you will about Ty France, he can hit velocity and he can find a way to push it the other way. I don't know if that's in there yet with Tyler Locklear. And then with Logan Evans, you know, I'm not, I'm just not as high on Logan Evans as, as a lot of other people. I, I, um, we haven't seen the 98 and 99 since Peoria. It was there. It flashed in bullpens, but he's been 92 to 94 all season. And out of the bullpen, it's been, you know, there's some 94s and 95s. But when you look at his arsenal, he may have six pitches, and that's great. And maybe he turns into um, something of a Chris Bassett. It's possible. But I don't see a guy that's going to strike out a whole lot of hitters. And because of that, I see Logan Evans as more as a number four starter, and I think they'll give him the opportunity to get there in 2025. And out of the bullpen, it just doesn't seem like he's this souped up version of, of what he has been as a starter. So I think he's got a chance to be a decent seventh inning type, um, a, a, a Justin Topa type out of the bullpen, and uh, hopefully a number four starter in, in the rotation as early as 2025. Cause, cause part of that is that one of his main pitches is his sinker, right? So he's more of a sinker baller slider guy. So less, a little less strikeout upside and more, you know, ground ball upside. Is that the general thought? Well, even, I mean, he mixes it up. Like it's, it's four seam, it's two seam sinker, cutter, mm -hmm. curveball, slider. I think he throws a split change uh, and he doesn't necessarily have like extraordinary whiff rates with any of those pitches. And that's why I kind of point to like the Chris Bassett type of a role where it's like, he's going to throw the kitchen sink at you. He may not overwhelm you or overpower you, um, but he's going to keep you off balance. And Hey, listen, there are, there have been some, some great pitchers in Mariners history that can eat seven innings by inducing soft contact. 
but ultimately I think that's the type of pitcher that he's going to be. I, I, I don't see him being this strikeout artist. I don't know if you remember Paul Abbott, but I, I get Paul Abbott vibes from Logan, Logan Evans. And maybe that's the route that, or the trajectory that he ends up getting. Yeah, we'll see what happens. Uh, the, the rumor was that he would be up by around the all-star break. You know, now Brian Wu is dealing with a hamstring injury, which is the first time that he's seen a hamstring. Uh, Emerson Hancock was pulled from his prior start with b- back tightness. I heard on one of your recent podcasts that, you know, maybe Logan Evans is going to be an option out of the starting rotation at some point this year for the Mariners. So we'll have to see with injuries and, and where they go with all that. I'm curious if they're going to have to add, you know, starting rotation depth to their uh, deadline wishes, or if they're just going to use, you know, from their system. Um, you mentioned that Ryan Bliss, it yeah. might not be in. Yeah, go for it. Oh no, I was you just going to say something. I, yeah. I was going to add with with Evans. Um, they've taken him out of, you know, they've slowed him down. Like they're they're throwing him one, maybe two innings at a time right now. Right. If they wanted to ramp him back up, I would be. I mean, it would be August until he would be ready right, to throw sure. extended innings in Seattle again. But the other part of it is too, like he's coming up on some pretty hefty innings ceilings here. He's he's racking up the innings, and he didn't throw a you know a Brinks truckload of innings at Pittsburgh. So. I would I would be surprised if they didn't just take the foot off the pedal and keep him in the bullpen the rest of the year. Yeah. And then you mentioned with Brian Bliss that it might not be in Seattle in which he he sees his upside. Do you see him as a potential, you know, trade option for, for the Mariners at the deadline this year? I do. Um, I, I think there are teams that would love to put, I, you look at a team like the White Sox and I'm not saying that Luis Robert or Garrett Crochet is, is of any significant, um, I'm not saying Ryan Bliss for one of those players is in the cards. Um, do I think he could be part of a package? Sure. But I look at a team like Chicago and I just say, how much would they love to have a Ryan Bliss right now at the top or bottom of their lineup? How much would the Pirates love to have one of those types of players at the top or bottom of their lineup to build around for the next six years? I just think there are teams that are worse positioned on the infield in Seattle going forward to utilize that type of a player. And Seattle could use a rental, a year and a half of a guy that might make a little bit more sense. Toronto is a great example. Like Toronto could use a second baseman and Bo Bichette is, is, you know, his free agency is coming up. Maybe they would be interested in Ryan Bliss, especially as an affordable option. But you look at, you know, Jorge Polanco has a player option for 2025. It doesn't look like that's going to be picked up as, as things stand today. But Seattle's got Rojas. They've got Dylan Moore. They've got J.P. Crawford. They've got Cole Young, who's going to be ready next year. At some point, maybe you look at this organization, this roster, and say, maybe we do have one more expendable middle infielder that we can use as a trade chip. Yeah, and he's been, I mean, Ryan Bliss, the fact that he was, uh, you know, one of the three that came from Paul Seawald was pretty outstanding. And he had 23 home runs, 55 stolen bases last year. The upside is definitely there. Um, mm-hmm. what other, what other trade options are, are you hearing about or running about if you've put, put together any scenarios? Uh, listen, I'll be the first to say, like, I haven't been reaching out to people about trades. I always just try and get to the draft and, and then, and then I'll go after it for two weeks with trades. I'll, I'll start making those types mm-hmm. of calls to those types of people. Um, but I, I think Seattle is going to have to be awfully creative. I, you know, I was talking to Jason on my, my other podcast and, I just think this is going to be one of those years where we may see contender for contender deals, you know, teams moving talent out of an excess position for talent in an excess position with another organization. And I don't know, I don't know where that is. Is it the Cubs and Ian Happ? I don't know. Is it, is it, you know, Nico Horner from the Cubs? You know, maybe Uh, are there deals to be had with the giants? Are there deals to be had with, with, uh, you know, I know, I know the Rays get brought up a lot, but you know, the Phillies, are there opportunities to go out and make a trade with a team that's clearly in it, uh, for a player that maybe they would want. And I don't know what that looks like. Um, I I can say Seattle has quite a bit of stashed talent right now in terms of prospects on the minor league end, uh, to move and play with. And Ryan bliss fits into that category. So I would encourage folks to be a little bit more creative in, in looking at what trades might make sense. Maybe it's not Vlad or Luis Robert or Mark Canna or some of these just bandied about ideas over and over and over. 
show me that, show me an idea with a team that's contending right now that might want to not only supplement their farm system, but open up a spot on their big league uh, lineup for a player that's blocked. You know, those are the types of things that I think are going to have to be an option for teams around the league right now. And right now, you know, there's not a ton of teams that are clear, clearly out of it. The national league is still really tied in the wild card race. And, you know, with, uh, with, just over a month until the deadline, you know, a lot still can, can happen. Um, Julio Rodriguez, what, what's going on with Julio? What are you seeing? What's, I mean, I posted a picture on uh, Instagram today comparing Jared Kelnick and Julio Rodriguez's stats. Of course, Jared Kelnick has had about a hundred plate appearances less, but it's like, I mean, Julio is severely underperforming and it seems like he's just not recognize, recognizes him pitches, but what are you seeing from Julio this so far this year? Yeah, I, uh, I, I don't know. I, I wish I could give you a more <laughs> prescriptive answer. Um, I think there's a lot of things at play. I think whenever you try and change your swing as a 22-year-old, 23-year-old uh, from something that was just innately God-gifted to you at a very young age, you're playing with fire a little bit. You know, you, if, you, if you look back at what Julio was in 2023, 284, 28 homers, 25 stolen bases or whatever it was 30 stolen bases i think anybody and everybody would look at that and go god what i wouldn't do for those numbers in this offense right now i, I think seattle would probably mm -hmm. be three or four games higher above 500 than they are to answer your question though and i'm generally not a half uh, a glass half full type of guy i don't know what can be done to fix this, let alone, except for Julio, just taking more reps. Maybe this is going to be a situation where he does not go to the all-star game. He gets four or five days off and he finally gets some time to rest and actually drill down on some swing changes that might click, but going out playing every single day, and I'm not saying they should bench him by any means, but going out and playing every single day, it's going to be next to impossible to make the swing changes necessary he's in this weird spot right now. And, and you may have noticed this with his swing this past week, he's in a weird spot where he's clearly reverted back to what he used to do in 2023. He's sinking his head. He's sinking into his hips at the, at the plate, but his bat path is totally different right now. And I think it's throwing off timing. I think it's throwing off pitch identification. Um, long story short, like too long didn't read. He's, he's a mess right now. And I think it's going to take, <laughs> I think it's going to take some significant time before it really kind of the light bulb goes on. Yeah. It's been said that the Mariners go as Julio goes. And right now, I mean, the Mariners are 26th in OPS on the year. They're second worst in batting average. They're obviously first in strikeouts. Uh, they have 55% more strikeouts than the Houston Astros. And Jeez. I mean, you, you look at the, the race in the AL West and the Astros are creeping back into it. The Mariners had a 10 game lead not too long ago before this last road trip, the Astros are now like four and a half games behind the Mariners. So it's like Julio has to figure it out. These other guys have to figure it out. And then at the same time, you know, the Mariners front office needs to figure out what to do to bring in true impact in this lineup because the Mariners have the one of, if not the best pitching staffs and starting rotations in all of baseball. And now it's time to, to match yeah. that and really put something behind them. It's interesting because I, I think I think you're right. I think Seattle has to has to make some moves and bring in new players, but at the same time, they're in a position where they can't really give up on the guys that they brought in. You can't just bail on Mitch Garver. I mean, you've got him for next year. Mm -hmm. um, he's so far below his career norms that you almost have to play the, the regress to the mean game. Like he has to. And I know we're in almost in July, but you still have to play that game to a certain extent. Jorge Polanco, kind of the same thing. Now, I, you know, listen, Polanco has been injured and um, he has a player option for 2025 that can easily be declined. He could technically be DFA'd and, and let go. Um, and, and Ryan Bliss could be given that that job. But we saw that when when Polanco was out, that middle infield does get, it gets thin. It gets thin pretty quickly. So, um they probably have to keep him around for, for a little bit longer. And, and he's another guy that's like, do you really think Jorge Polanco is going to be a 71 OPS plus after years of being a 120 guy, right. years of being a 120 guy? There has to be some regression back to the mean with all of these guys. 
But to your point, they have to raise the ceiling with, with a right-handed corner outfielder and, you know, potentially a guy that can play a little bit of third base and, and, and thump. Kind of following up to that and talking about career norms. And I mean, I'm kind of dumbfounded at this point to where it's been so many years, year over year to where they bring in guys and then they underperform in Seattle. Uh, you look at Tasker Hernandez's splits last year at home versus away. And it's something like 80 points in batting average is what he was better on the road. What have you heard about playing in Seattle? Because it seems like the road teams come in and, and they have no no issues at all. Is it, is it the Mariners, you know, coaching and and their their hitting philosophy that's bringing these changes? Is it the stadium? Is it the the marine layer? Like, what what have you heard that that's been affecting these guys? Well, it is going to warm up. So generally, the Mariners' offense does pick up in July, August, and September, and it's picked up in June. So that does that does go along with the narrative. Um, I I think teams in general struggle in Seattle more than they do at home as well. I you know Seattle struggles at home. I, actually, I think this year is a bit of an outlier. I think Seattle actually does hit the ball a bit better at home than they do on the road. But in any case, um, it's not coaching. It's not any of that. It's just. Um, I don't really have a word for it. You know, I have heard from a couple of players, Tyler O'Neill being one of them, uh, that the batter's eye can be a little bit wonky in afternoon games. Um, it's a little bit of a glare. So maybe those day games are especially difficult for Seattle to hit in. But, you know, the the days of, of Justin Smoke complaining about the marine layer and Kyle Seeger complaining about that wet air knocking the ball down, I just, you know, they already brought the, they already brought the fences in once. It, it can't be everything at some point. And I know this is a, a tiresome narrative. Maybe I'm just tired of talking about it. At some point, it just falls on the players to put the ball in play, you know, and if it is the batter's eye, then it's the batter's eye. But um, it's your job to put the ball in play and make things happen. And they just don't do it at home. So more of a coincidence than anything. Yeah. And speaking of the batter's eye, that, that was Teoscar Hernandez's uh, reasoning for having the better you know, splits on the road versus at home. I'm curious if they're going to just flatten out the batter's eye so that it's not angled so that, you know, if it, during those day games, there might be a reflection there. There's got to be a fix at some point. Yeah, man. Um, be a yeah, good, I, I bet it would be a pretty, then, yeah. I, I don't know if, um, I don't know if flattening it would be cost effective, but I think you could <laughs> put a matte black, you know, light right. absorbing, material over that that acts a whole lot better than what they they've got this weird mesh i don't even know you've you've been there everyone listening to this has, has been to t-mobile park they have this weird like reflective mesh type um you know I, I don't even know but yeah they could probably lay something flat black that eats up the light that would that would make it a lot easier for guys yeah maybe uh some of the boeing executives can come in and figure out a unique paint job or something for that to, to help out. Couldn't be that expensive. Um, I mean, what, all right. 10 grand to, to replace that whole thing or not replace it, but just lay something over it. It wouldn't be that expensive. 10 grand and your team is automatically, you know, points better than where they were in there in the playoffs. That'd be pretty nice. That'd be worth the cost. Yeah. Um, yeah. getting back into the, getting back into the draft. Um, yeah. Outside of the names that we already talked about, who are some, some guys that aren't being talked about very much that might jump up and make an impact that you think for Seattle or just uh, sleepers and just in, general. in general. Yeah. Yeah. Just sleepers in general. Yeah. I think, I think I, I point to the guys that have, I'm generally a sucker for polished approaches. You know, I like a guy in the draft that makes a ton of contact, makes a ton of contact in the zone and doesn't chase. You know, if you find me a, a mature hitter in the sec, chances are that's going to translate. I mean, the pitching is going to get better, but you can't really teach swing decisions. You can, but you more so pe uh, uh, you more so teach like uh, reluctance to swing or aggressiveness. I think a guy like Ryan Waldschmidt, the outfielder at Kentucky is a, is a really interesting one for me. Um, it's elite swing decisions. He makes a ton of contact. He's done it two years in a row. He got hurt on the Cape. I'd like to have seen what he could have done there, but he can run. Um, he's a left fielder by trade is uh, guys like that, uh, guys like James Tibbs at Florida state are really interesting to me. Um, the guys that are the volatile ones, you know, the Vance Honeycuts, the Dakota Jordans, those guys that have a ton of swing and miss, I think you're really kind of playing with fire in those. I know they've got bigger tools, but 
they're the dangerous ones to draft. So like if I was Seattle, James Tibbs would be on the radar big time. Ryan Walsh, would be on the radar, uh, radar. I, I think a guy like Kalen Culpepper at Kansas state is a little bit undervalued. I think he could be on the radar. Malcolm Moore, the catcher at Stanford. These are all good swing decision guys uh, that I think will see their game transition quickly. You, you throw a guy like Vance Hunnicutt or Dakota Jordan into Everett, they're going to struggle. You throw a guy like Ryan Walshman or James Tibbs into, into, into Everett, they might hit 315 out of the gate. So um, those would be the guys that I would circle. I've heard that the SEC competition is is like high A to in between high A and double A. Is that is that accurate? I would say high A. I, I think double A is still a little bit too rich from from my untrained eye. Like the thing about double A is it's it's not only is, is it big stuff, it's top prospects. It's generally mm-hmm. three pitches and it's generally average or better command. Like guys are throwing it in the zone. Guys are painting the corners. Uh and and guys have weapons to get left handy uh, left handers and right handers out. You don't see that, I would say, in half of the games that you see on the SEC. Like the vast majority of SEC arms, the good ones, are fastball, slider. They do have a very below average or fringy changeup that they can't really land. So a lot of times a hitter can just eliminate that pitch. Not really the case in double A. You're going to see a a little bit more of a menu. Everett, high A, you're generally going to see two, two and a half pitches spotty command so you're going to see higher than normal walk rates so i subscribe to the idea that high a is the equivalent of the sec and i think that's why you're seeing guys go right to high a and some of them make the double a jump before the end of their rookie season yeah interesting and then um you know getting into last year's draft paul skeens one dylan cruz two it's been amazing to see what paul skeens has done so far this year um dylan cruz is still on the rise and some other guys uh, of the guys that were drafted last year that are approaching the big leagues or in the big leagues, which ones stand out to you? I mean, Paul Skeens is just insane. White Langford has found success really quickly. Uh, what are some yeah. of those names to you? Skeens stands out to me. I mean, <laughs> I think it's so funny that it's insane. people, it's insane. He's insane. I mean, I pitch number 100 at 102 miles an hour. <laughs> what are we doing? He's laughing on the mound. Everyone else. What are we doing? Yeah. Why is this guy in Indianapolis at any point in 2024? I don't get it. Um, no, like Paul Skeens has been unbelievable. I didn't think he was this good. I'll be the first to say it. Now, I wasn't <laughs> one of those guys that was like dead zone fastball. He's going to struggle. Like I wasn't like that. But I also thought the change, he barely used the change up in college. He didn't need to. I thought it was mostly a two trick pony with flashes of the change up at air force in 2022 Mm -hmm. what he is doing is crazy i mean it's just (laughs) crazy it doesn't matter the lineup yeah shohei got him uh shohei otani got him but he punked the dodgers lineup for several innings uh so skeins has been crazy i think uh one thing that goes a little bit under celebrated is just how unfreaking believable wyatt langford was in the minor leagues i know he hasn't been a superstar or even a star with texas yet but what he did in double A and triple A months after, you know, leaving Florida is crazy. It's just crazy. Uh, and then the other things I would point out Colt Emerson. And I know that I just said, uh, you know, walks don't really matter in high A and low A. That dude is taking the most polished at bats using the whole field. He's looked good at shortstop. It's a shame that he got hurt because I think he probably would be in Everett with Laz Montez and Michael Arroyo right now, but he really stands out. A couple other guys that I would point out just as outliers, Kevin McGonigal with Detroit has been awesome. I mean, he's been really, really good. And then like a fourth rounder that I was just reading about today, uh, writing about researching Christian Campbell, Georgia Tech's uh, shortstop who was taken by the Red Sox. He's been spectacular up to double A. So maybe more people need to be talking about him. Yeah. Like you mentioned, Paul Skeens has been absolutely insane. He's got like five or six pitches. That slider, that sweeping slider is, it looks like it's moving three feet up there. And you have to defend against 102. He has Um, the most hidden, he must hide the hell out of 102 miles an hour. Like, I I don't know. I, I don't, it is a dead zone fastball. It is kind of a weirder slot. It is a weirder arm action. Guys just don't pick it up. I mean, I know that it's a cliche to say they're late on 102, but they're really late. 
on 102 and they're they're inches several inches away from making contact it's pretty unbelievable stuff and then his split fingers at 94 this splinker thing and um yeah he's been ridiculous uh going into white langford you mentioned that he was really good at uh in the minor leagues in 2023 yeah he bat, he bat 360 with 10 home runs 12 stolen bases over 44 games across high a double a triple a which is insane 360 1.157 ops and he has it's shown insane. the sparks in, in texas yeah i think he's gonna i think it's all gonna come together he hasn't looked overmatched his contact quality just hasn't been what it was and once he kind of settles in and, and gets a better feel for what pro pitching is going to be all about and how guys are going to pitch to him you imagine just changing changing levels and changing leagues that fast i mean that is a crash course on stuff we were just talking about what the stuff looks like at high a there's a lot of bum 26 year olds throwing crap at high a there's a lot of bum 30 year olds at double a throwing innings there's uh, same with triple a too like there, that's not a huge jump that jump from double a to the big leagues it's just and uprooting too like you're uprooting your life every time at one place for six weeks and then you're expected to perform um that really needs to be celebrated more more than it has been yeah people forget that these guys are human you know and having to l live in a new spot uh the travel that these guys have to go through throughout the minor leagues i've heard the stories of on the buses and and all these travel uh, the conditions have gotten better in the past couple of years due to the CBA. So I've heard, but um, yeah, it's just incredible what these guys are able to do. Um, Joe, really appreciate your time. Always, always fun being able to talk with you and pick your brain on these prospects and what's going on. And again, if you're listening to this, go check out the Overslot podcast. He's got great stuff all the time that he's posting. So really appreciate your time. Hey, Connor, anytime. I appreciate uh, I appreciate the invite, and I'm, I'm looking forward to the next time we get a chat. Out to center. This is cranked. It's way back. And